Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Living Word Lutheran Church. Glad that we can come together for our Lenten service tonight. Uh, worship our Lord and Savior together. Our call to worship for this evening is from 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. And this, the love of God, was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We'll open up our service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's bow and worship in prayer. Heavenly Father, we commit this night to you and ask, Lord, that you would be glorified in our meditations here and our worship and our praise uh, as we hear the word proclaimed as we take time to center ourselves on your coming and the message of the cross, pray, Lord, that you would come and do a work in our midst. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing our opening hymn, 533 at Calvary. <laughs> I guess you may be seated. As we talked about last week when we were looking at the commandments, Jesus in his ministry, what he does on the Sermon on the Mount is he really expands the range and scope of the commandments. Uh, he says to them, you heard it was said, you shall not murder, but I tell you whoever has even a hateful thought toward his brother has committed murder in his heart. Uh, Jesus looks at the law of God and it's more concerned than just with the outward actions, but the heart that we bring to it. And, and so when we come to these commandments and take time to acknowledge our sin, 
Uh, I would just encourage you and remind you of, of Jesus' focus with that, that it's not just the external action, but it's also the matter of the heart. And Martin Luther picks up on that, I think, really well in his explanation uh, of the commandments in the small catechism. And so we'll use that tonight for our recognition of sin. Would you join me as we read these together? Seventh commandment, thou shalt not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not rob our neighbor of his money or property, nor bring them into our possession by unfair dealing or fraud, but help him to improve and protect his property in living. The eighth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not deceitfully lie about, betray, backbite, nor slander our neighbor, but defend him, speak well of him, and put the most charitable construction on all that he does. Think about your life as it is put in front of the mirror of God's law and commandments. How often maybe are we not necessarily going around and taking things that are not ours, but maybe we're certainly also not helping to improve the situations of those around us. Um, maybe we're not like we were as a little child stealing a candy bar from the local store, but maybe we're stealing the time of our employer. Maybe we are squandering that which we're being compensated for. Uh, there are many ways practically that we break this commandment more often than we recognize. Uh, when I think about the Eighth Commandment especially, um, man, how often, even in churches, uh, where you would expect you know, the saints of God would be speaking well of people, that we find those who will gossip or speak ill of others. And I love that line that Luther uses here, instead, putting the most charitable construction on all that he does. Um, when you're faced with a situation and looking at uh, someone and how they would um, be dealing with something, we can look at it in the worst possible way, like, well, they must be thinking this, this, or that, or choosing to say, well, what could the best way of looking at this maybe be? And um, as you think about both of those commandments, my guess is, like me, you probably recognize that there's times in your life, maybe even today or this week, that you have fallen short of God's law. And that's what happens when we come face to face with the word of God. It points out our sin. It points out where we have fallen short, uh, where we have gone astray. Uh, but the good news that I have to proclaim to you is that when we come to a place where we recognize our sin, it's actually a really good place to be. Um, because when we, when we come to a place where we recognize it, when we acknowledge it, then we can do something about it. Uh, pity the person who walks around thinking they're perfect and don't deal with the problems that are really there. And so we, we take time every service, both on Sundays and during Lent, to recognize our sin, to recognize times that we've blown it, um, so that we can come and bring our sin to our Savior. And the Word of God comes and tells us that when we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For a responsive reading, we'll be reading through our sermon text. Uh, Kyle is going to be giving the message tonight. Excited about that. I am going to be going and giving a message for the youth tonight about uh, gender identity and pro-life, pro-choice arguments. So you can pray for me. I told Kyle I'd switch with him any day. So John 14, 15 through 31. Here we go. I'll ask you to respond with the bold type. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Father, 
Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, The Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father, and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. For the time during Lent, uh, we have been doing the responsive readings. Uh, Traditionally here for our church, we just do a scripture reader on Sunday mornings, but um, one of the reasons why we do responsive readings during Lent is that it's a, a season where we get a chance to do a other things, we do the commandments for our confession of sin and uh, etc. But when we look in the Old Testament, we see that a lot of times the people of God do, did do a call and response, either of songs or scripture reading. And so it's also um, a, an appropriate way to hear God's word and participate with that also. For our offering during the season, we have been uh, giving money designated toward our youth fund and that will be what our Lenten and Easter offerings are going to. Uh, There are a couple of camps and conferences that are planning on happening uh, this summer, one of them at the Ark, uh, one of them at our uh, Bible College for Youth, uh, will be kind of more apologetics-based that we're hoping to send our youth to. And so the monies that we're collecting during this time is going to be going toward helping support our youth to go to those. Um, Let's go ahead and just pray and commit these gifts unto the Lord. Heavenly Father, we ask that as we uh, are giving during this season of Lent and Easter, that you would use these things that are given in order to help uh, and trust and strengthen the foundation of our young people in this church and for their friends and those that they may invite as well. I pray, Lord, especially for those who are up and coming, that they would come to a place where not only are they trusting in you, but that they would know why. Uh, That it wouldn't just be because they've been told to by someone, but that they have come to believe that you really who are who you say you are, that you are the Savior for their souls. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, go ahead and continue then. Hymn number 515, Room at the Cross, for you. Yes. 
room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. The hand of my Savior is strong, and the love of my Savior is long. Though sunshine or rain, through loss or in gain, the blood flows from Calvary to cleanse every stain. There's room at the cross for still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for this day that we can come together and worship you. Uh, we thank you that uh, we can open up your word freely. Uh, we know that your word is truth. Uh, we know that as your word goes forth, that it accomplishes what you will. And so we pray that that would uh, be the case for us today, that you would um, change us and uh, mold our hearts to be more like your son. In his name we pray. Amen. So a number of years ago, I accepted a position as a youth director at a church not too far from here. It was meant to be a pretty short-term position. Uh, it was, I was at a point in my life where I, I realized I'd been running away from God's calling to go to seminary. And so I decided, I just said, you know what, I'm just going to finish my bachelor's as soon as I can and then go to seminary. And so I, I took this position um, just long enough to finish my bachelor's, and so I knew it was only going to be a year or two while I was there. And uh, so we got there and um, had a pretty small house with a pretty small driveway. Um, you, if you drive your car into the driveway, if you don't put it in just the right spot, you would stick your foot out the car and you'd already be on the grass. It was so narrow. You could fit maybe two cars uh, lengthwise and then maybe just have three or four feet open at the end. And so considering everything, that I was only going to be there for a short time, and considering how small the driveway was, um, wouldn't be there for too many winters, I made the decision not to get a snowblower. And you can probably know where, where this is going. <laughs> but there was one winter I woke up, and uh, not exaggerating, there was a good foot and a half of snow in the driveway. And I'm thinking, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. I uh, guess I better just get started. And so I, I grabbed my shovel and proceeded to try to shovel off all that snow. And uh, about an hour and a half, or an hour later, I was, I was tired, I was sweaty, I was definitely slowing down, I wasn't moving as fast as I was before. And I was thinking, you know what, this is, this is just not going to work by myself. I could really use some help. And I glanced over my neighbor's driveway, who had, a, a, his drive was at least a good three times the size. And he did, was not using a shovel. He, he was not even using a snowblower. He had a bobcat. And you have no idea how excited I was when I saw him get done with his driveway and bring his bobcat over to my driveway to help me out. <laughs> it was just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. I really needed help. It would have been another three, four hours to finish that driveway by myself. So that was a moment when I really needed help, and thankfully, I got some. And we all know what, it, what it's like to need help, don't we? Um, we like to think that we can do everything on our own. We like to think we're Mr. And, or Ms. Independent, and that we can just handle everything by ourselves. But every once in a while, we all need help. And sometimes that may be that you go grocery shopping and you just, you have multiple kids and so it's a big job just to bring the groceries in. Or maybe it's 
something like you find a couch on Facebook Marketplace that you really like, uh, it's going to be really tough to move it by yourself. You're going to need some help. Or maybe it's something a little more serious and it's a, a health issue. Uh, maybe you uh, slept wrong or lifted wrong and, and threw out your back. Uh, you're not going to try to fix your back by yourself. I mean, you're going to want to go to a chiropractor for something like that. Maybe you have a broken bone. Uh, you're not going to try to do surgery on yourself, um, surgery on your elbow or something. I mean, that's, that wouldn't work very well. So we all need help. And in our text today, we see that the disciples need some help. And Jesus knows that. He also knows that we need help. And so he sent a helper. He sent the Holy Spirit. And so what does the Holy Spirit help with? Well, we're going to look at three of those ways that we see in our text today. The first way we see in, in verse 17 is that the Holy Spirit imparts truth. Uh, we see uh, that the world cannot receive him. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. And why, why is that? Well, as we look over, uh, we think of uh, the chapter in, in Romans where it says that no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, and no one seeks after God. This is the state of every human being when we are on our own. So I want to look a little bit closer at, at verse 17. And the word, there's the word uh, cannot, cannot receive. And so we look at Romans, we see there's this lack of desire to, um, to seek after God. There's a lack of desire to be righteous. But we also see in our text that there's more than just a lack of desire. There's the lack of ability to be righteous on our own. There's the lack of ability to seek after God. And this is because of our sinful nature. This is because of our hardness of heart. Uh, we're, we're prideful. We think we're pretty good people. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that, you know, pity is the man who, who thinks he's perfect, doesn't notice his faults. And on our own, that's, that's where we are. We don't see our sin, and we don't see a need our need for a savior. And without the Holy Spirit, we're not open to the truth. And there's, I think one thing that makes it really hard for us to be open to the truth, uh, especially in our culture, is we don't even know what truth is. We don't even understand truth. Uh, to quote Pilate, what is truth? You know, you ask that question today, and you're going to get a lot of different answers from a lot of different people. Someone might say, well, my truth is this faith, or my truth is that faith. Or, well, I realize that's your truth, but, and that's fine. That can be true for you, but it's just, it's not true for me. Uh, as, if, as if truth is relative. But we know truth isn't relative. There is only one truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And the Holy Spirit is the one who makes us open to the truth. We aren't open to the truth on our own. He is the one who makes us open to Jesus. And when we trust in Jesus, we see that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. So we see the Holy Spirit imparts truth, and we see that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. So the disciples, they're concerned, and rightfully so. They have their teacher, their leader, their, their rabbi, this guy they've been following for years. He's telling them that he's going to leave, and the disciples really don't know what they're going to do without him. Uh, Jesus says something that should be encouraging, um, not only to the disciples, but should be encouraging to us as well. Jesus assures them that the helper dwells in his people, and because of that, they will have an intimate fellowship with Jesus and God the Father. So I'm going to read verse 20 again. It says, In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So this is a really big deal. Just a little bit ago, we're talking about our old nature, our sinful nature. We're talking about how no one is righteous. We're talking about how no one seeks after God. Not only is there a lack of desire, but there's a lack of ability. And then 
we go over to see to this verse, and we see that the Holy Spirit uh, is going to dwell in us. And that's just the exact opposite of what we were talking about earlier. We go from not being righteous to being righteous. We go from not seeking God to seeking God. We go from being enemies with God to having fellowship with God. We go from having that broken relationship to having that stored relationship to the way it was supposed to be. Now, keep in mind just how it is that even happens. So the disciples, uh, they weren't these just wonderful, wonderful, good people. They, were, they argued quite a bit. Uh, they disagreed. They wanted to do things like keep children away from Jesus because Jesus is too important to be bothered with children, was their thinking. Uh, they also argued about who was the greatest among them. They got upset about uh, having a discussion on who would sit at Jesus' right hand and on their left. And so that you, wouldn't really descri- you wouldn't describe them as, as good people. Uh, but it's also not because of their commitment to Christ. Uh, we know the story. Um, the, the soldiers come to, to the garden and um, the, the disciples flee. Uh, they, they don't even stay there with him. Uh, and before that, they don't even stay awake with him as he prays. Uh, we have Peter who said that he would never deny Jesus and he denied Jesus three times. So it's not that disciples are such good people. It's not that they are just so committed to Christ as to, to why this happens, why we have this, this great reversal. It's because it's a gift. It's because of this helper, the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. And it's the same for for us, for those who are trusting in Christ. We're not good on our own. It's not our commitment that brings us fellowship with God. It's not our our good deeds or our, our selflessness that brings us to fellowship with God. It's the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. It's the Holy Spirit changing our hearts, the Holy Spirit changing our minds, the Holy Spirit opening us to the truth and dwelling within us. So the difference between us, those who are, the difference between those who are following Christ and the world, it isn't that those who are following Christ are such good people on their own or just so committed on on their own. The difference is the Holy Spirit. Uh, imagine, if you will, that uh, we're, we're all homeless, we're all hungry, uh, we're, we're all beggars, we're spiritual beggars. And as, as Christians, um, we don't, when we tell people about Christ, when we share our faith, when we um, tell them that their, their sins um, can be, are forgiven in, in Christ and invite them to trust in him, we don't do it in a looking down on them and I'm better than you type of an attitude. It's one beggar showing another beggar where the food is. And so we see that the Holy Spirit imparts truth. We see that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And we also see that the Holy Spirit helps us to keep Christ's commands. And so we have that in a number of different verses here. In verse 15, I'm just going to read them quick here. Uh, We have Jesus saying, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. In verse 21, we have Jesus saying, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. In verse 23, Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And then in verse 24, we have the opposite. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And so the point of these verses here, um, Jesus isn't saying, you have to keep all of my commandments, every single one, all the time, and as soon as you break just one of them, then that's, that means you don't love me. That's proof that you don't love me. That's not the point. The point Jesus is making is, is like saying, if you are loving me, this will be the result. You, this, you will keep my commandments. Or another way of thinking about it, is you will keep my commandments if you indeed love me. So the idea here is it's not a a command so much as Jesus encouraging his disciples to do some self-reflection. He's asking them, when it comes to my commands, 
Are you keeping watchful care to keep them? When it comes to my commands, are you cherishing them? Or when it comes to my commands, are you holding them like a treasure? And are you going through lengths to to not violate them? And if not, then maybe you should ask yourself, do you love me? And so I encourage you also to do some some self-reflection. And when it comes to Jesus' commands, uh, it's the the same thing. Are you keeping watchful care? Uh, Are you cherishing them? Are you you holding them as a treasure? Are you taking pains not to violate them? And if not, uh, Jesus is asking you, do you love me? You know, we as as Bible-believing Christians, we do a, a really good job of emphasizing that we need help coming to terms with our sin and trusting in Christ. Uh, But we also need the Holy Spirit to help continue to love Christ, and that keeping his commands is a result of that love. We don't do it to earn his love. And so we have the the culmination of of this text here at at the end, where Jesus says that he's going away. Uh, Jesus going away was really always part of the plan, whether the disciples realized it or not. Jesus' death, his his resurrection and ascension, it was no surprise to Jesus. It was part of the plan. This is why Jesus came in the first place. Without Jesus' death and resurrection, we would still be waiting for the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Uh, Death wouldn't have been defeated. Now, Jesus knew he was going to accomplish his mission, uh, during our text, he was not quite. On, he was on his way to the cross, and he knew he was going to accomplish that mission. But he also knew that his disciples would need help. And even on this side of the cross, Jesus has accomplished his mission. But he knew that we need help, and so that is why Jesus sent a helper. On our own, we have no desire to seek after God. On our own, we have no ability to seek after God. We're stuck in our sin. And so the Holy Spirit comes to impart truth. Now, on our own, we have this broken relationship with God, and we are enemies with him. So the Holy Spirit comes and and dwells in us so that we can have fellowship with God again. And left to our own devices, we think that we can earn God's love by following his commands. And so the Holy Spirit comes and reminds us that it, for us to, to follow Christ's commands, it's not to earn his love, but it's something that we do out of love for him. And so I ask, are you trying to live the Christian life on your own? Are you thinking that with enough effort you'll succeed? Are you thinking that with enough intellectual prowess that you can um, that you can know the scriptures on your own? Well, the disciples couldn't do this on their own, and neither can you, and neither can I. Instead of trusting in ourselves, we're invited to look to the Helper, the Spirit of Truth, who points us to the truth, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, again, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you uh, that we do um, not try, have to try to come to you on our own. Uh, we know that we can't. We, we don't have that desire. Uh, we don't even have that ability to come to you on our own. So we thank you that you have sent your Holy Spirit to, to come and to do a work in our hearts, uh, do a work in our lives, uh, so that we can uh, be made right with you again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue in our worship service, I invite you to please rise as we sing hymn number 396, I Lay My Sins on Jesus. the spotless lamb of god he 
He bears them all and frees us from the accursed load. I bring my guilt to Jesus to wash my crimson stains. White in his blood most precious till not a spot remains. I lay my wants on Jesus, all fullness dwells in him. He heals all my diseases, he doth my soul redeem. I lay my griefs on Jesus, my burdens and my cares. He from them all releases, he all my sorrows shares. I long to be like Jesus, meek, loving, lowly, mild. I long to be like Jesus, the Father's holy child. I long to be with Jesus amid the heavenly throng, to sing with saints his praises, to learn the Let us together pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.